to get back on Femme Queen Crazy Sexy and Cool, make sure you like, subscribe, and comment. Mm. Welcome to another episode of Crazy, Sexy, Se Cool. The girls don't know who they are. <laughs> <laughs> What's up, y'all? What's up? What's up? What's goody? No shade. I miss my girlies. I How miss y'all too. It's been like a week. So, I feel like we've been away from so each other. There's little ships and there's big ships, but there's nothing like this friendship. Oh, I, I love when you say that, that. Sissy. I really do. <laughs> I really love that. Yeah. Damn, since so you threw that back. <laughs> That's how that liquor get you, girl. <laughs> it's okay. Listen, it's been a full week. Yeah. Can we start off with like one car affirmation? Okay, that's cute. Yes, where'd you get these Shout from? These is cute. Some Marjala. She got me these for my birthday. Okay. And it's affirmations for our badasses. Mm. So pick one. And read it. What does yours say? Don't mm. try to fit in. You were born to stand out. How you doing? <laughs> Bad <laughs> out. That was me. That That's was all brand. <laughs> this is such a key. Um, the best shit happens outside of my comfort zone. It really does. It's so yeah. true. And I'm scared. I'm scared of outside of my comfort zone. Bad no, no, no. You got to get out. Mine says, some women fear the fire. Some women Simply become it. Yes. Every sign. Let's go, fire Good. sign. Let's go. <laughs> Don't go. that bitch. Yeah. Yeah. She is. I thought she was about to start bogging, bitch. bitch. <laughs> she, she was about to start selling that bitch. Yeah. That was <laughs> affirmations <laughs> of bad, for badasses. Thank you so much, Michelle. I love it. I had to share it with my girls. Yes, I love yeah. sisters like that. That's just, I love girls like that. Yes. Michelle is always very positive and, um, just mm -hmm. things like that. Oh, She's my God. It was so sweet. Mm -hmm. I came home. It was sitting at my door. I was like, what is this? She yeah. was like, I sent you a gift, girl. You know how she said, I sent you yes. a gift, girl. It's she delivered. Always, she sent me a book <laughs> of affirmations. Oh, I love it. Oh, that's it. beautiful. I love oh, yeah, that. Like, that's the right friend. Okay. They see you here. They see you. They see the road you're on. And they give it to you. I love that. Me too. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. So how much have been up to this weekend? How was your week? Mine was good. I just won grand prize yes, at the IS. Congratulations. 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 You looked cold. <laughs> you looked Look, cold. Okay. Listen, I looked it good <laughs> because, baby, I told you about that boot camp, right? The much in the camp, the camp, I didn't get all, mm. I didn't hit all the I know checks. it's stirred because you have that, y'all have <laughs> I didn't nothing. Hit what I, didn't, I, didn't I know it's stirred yes. because, I yo, I didn't hit all the checks, It's a group of women. <laughs> yes. That Margiela boot camp. So, my, but, yes. what happens like, <laughs> so with Tabitha, especially like, you know, with Tabitha, because her eyes sometimes can get a little tricky when it comes yeah. to picking out stuff. So she box. knows that yo, it's best box. that we start doing it together. Mm -hmm. And we start picking stuff like earlier on. Tabitha trap, like she, like <laughs> she didn't say you. I really, I was like, what are you wearing? Like, mm -hmm. cause usually we have that conversation, <laughs> and she know when it's closer to the time. If she thinks it's something, I'm a question. She's giving. Let me just show her now because it's last minute, and there's nothing else I can do. Like she's not gonna, I can't do nothing about <laughs> it. I'm like, bitch, just you. don't show me then. Like, so you, as I said, in the Margella boot camp, right. So it's kind of like, you know, it's they want the best version. Yeah. And my thing is, sometimes that may not fit, you know, what we're looking for for this specific category. 
But I do know that when I lick, like listen and take a little direction, because it's not like they don't. Girl, take, they sometimes don't hold that might fit not fit what we're looking for in this category. That's what I say in this category. What? I, huh, what we want? What you said? What the what? Uh, what the category want? call for? And what the brand looks for? Bitch, anything that the girl that oh, feels she, like you, she's trying it. Yeah, she's trying Don't to. ever ask me to help you with you nothing. Tried to. Wear whatever you want to wear. <laughs> you it has see? Nothing you tried to. Do. I, I know anything about a category. My brand is going to fit whatever because category I Because I would say this. I'm not, I'm not so about that. So did you see? So, uh, like, so that's what I meant was that. See, it came out wrong. Asia, so, so what let's happened was I started. Talk about, no, let's not get into it. We're, it's okay. We're going to cut that one out. No, but you're not going to cut it out. We're going to keep it in because here's the thing. It's no shade. Like, I love my ladies. So, girl, you want to give them an example because the way you just said that was like kind of like because you still feel like you're right about something no. and you think that we were telling you wrong because it doesn't fit the brand but you know more about the category because she did tell me she's a ruler for it so <laughs> oh my god like, that came she did get no you know, oh my god Ma, is that where that's coming from so let me be no very, it's coming no, from what you let just me said. be very clear it's not like i have the right idea i think collectively we pour into each other and what happens with that they want the best version of you for yourself and sometimes I go a little left in what I want, and they're like, okay, girl, that's not going to work. So Simone was very proud of me, but she was like, you want in that suit? Because we had a whole different idea on what we went, but it was last minute for me to get the input. So it's not a bad thing in the book and, and, and like the little boot camp and just having that sisterly I affection. I hate that word, boot camp. So it's not yeah. a boot it's camp. There's nothing wrong with it. Don't, I I, my generation, we, we love it. My generation loves it. No, because That's it feels good when by. you have the girls pour into you like that. It's Why you don't wait? But it That's, doesn't sound like pouring into it. It sounds like, I don't know, like. I think the that's love. It. It, it's, but it, that's I what I mean. Like for, me, it's love. for me, it's coming from a place of love. It sounds like a and like Because they don't have to care. No, it's they don't, not hazing, they don't have Ma. To. It's not, listen, it is not a bad thing. Like, especially when we talk about when we want to pour into each other and the difficulties that happen. Of course, if you're pouring into somebody who does not like necessarily do those things, it's going to be a little give and take, right? Mm. So, And that's how it is when some of the youth are resistant to things that we say to each other. So the same is with us. We're not going to always agree on what we see on what we want. Yeah. But what I've learned is that trusting them because they know what's best for like, they, they're going to be like, this is what's going to work. And then nine times out of 10, every time that I've done it, I've won. Right, and that's not saying that oh, well, Tabitha is crazy. She don't know how to bring her category. No, it's no. just that they know how to sharpen it to make it more. But appealing that's to what the that's what houses are. See, and right. that's I see right. that's uh, well. I'm gonna give your house roses for that because I think that's what's missing in ballroom. You don't have especially a group of women that are sitting there and getting their products together. They're making it's sure that you're presentable to. for these categories and not just when, not just getting tens. They want to make sure you win and they want to make sure you excel and make those moments. Every that's time something that should be praised. I have won. So mm. that's why I say shouts to the house of Mason Margella. Uh. Thank you for all you do for me, Ma. Like it wasn't no shade. Like no, dead ass. Yeah. But we um, can. again, no, 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 don't key like that because we I can. take it personal. Because, <laughs> we know you're not like, like I know, like I, I have been able to walk in one way and they like take that whole shit off because that's not what we do in a day. And I'll be like, what? Uh, wait, <laughs> you have any openings? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> listen, when you come from a house no, you, you got a, a label and diva we got like Simone. 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 I'll be scared. I'll be Simone. scared though. They might send me home crying. Yeah, Simone be like, no, and, listen, never, it's and for years, so that shit off. Is start. I'm more of the Girl, let's try something else. Uh -huh. she be like, Girl, so you no, 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 she do it go, reverse. Go, go put this on. She go do it reverse. She says, do you, how do you feel? Do yeah, you I think it you looks like nice? That? Do you like that? <laughs> and if I'm questioning, I'm like, damn. <laughs> <laughs> and for years, my mom, Letitia, wanted me to walk in heels. I remember Simone gave me them damn Giuseppe's. <laughs> I was tipping around the house. <laughs> 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 I was like, girl, you look for heels? Like, what is I'm, I tell her now, I be like, Go lower in the heel, because I'd rather you go lower than the heel to see you up there wobbling. <laughs> so, if you ever see them girls that be shaking, they hear me shaking. I'll be like, I'll be like, this is okay. Yeah. Bitch, I remember I gagged one time like that too, now, bitch. Bitch, I remember I was yeah. battling a bitch. My legs just kept, bitch, I laid on the floor. You would have thought I was giving a face pose. I laid on the floor. Bitch, the legs had a gave out, bitch. The heels had a got me together, bitch. Then legs started going. 
But yeah, enough about the mods. <laughs> love. Yeah. And the love that we had. And it all sparked, like, and that's why we have that sistery love, like that where Michelle would send those gifts because that's how much we want the best for each other and we pour into it. And I, and I think all houses should be like that, mm -hmm. especially amongst the women. It's important because yeah, I come from I think the era, like, where it's a us. brand. Like, you mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? You knew what houses were those houses. Like, you know what I'm saying? They had a certain look. Or whatever about them, no matter what, you kind of knew when this person hit the floor. Oh, they were a Mugler, or they were an Ebony, or they were was whatever. And so that's what I model my house after. No matter what category you walk, I want us all to look, give a certain thing. Like you know what I'm saying? That it's giving. Okay, that's a family. Like they ride together, they present together. Like they yes. want everybody to be feeling the that. feeling. <laughs> like, no, I that's love okay. that. This is why, like, <laughs> like I love the house. So much because I could be having. I can a see down the love day. that y'all have for each other. Like definitely. I could be seeing a down That's day and randomly, yeah. randomly they'd be like, "Yo, we having a girls' dinner." I'm like, "Okay," and that be just what I needed in that moment. And it's like I didn't even have to ask for that. Mm -hmm. We just know, okay, we've been away for a couple of weeks. Let's get together. Yeah. And whether it's at for drinks over dinner, we'll meet where you at. Oh, I'm in the city. I'm on my way now, and yeah. it's just like that. Yeah. Um, my brother, my nephew Ness, the other day shared with me randomly because we all hung out together and he actually said that this is the close like i feel so close when we do stuff like this just random shit where we just all hang out for no reason we just land together yeah and i think that's the organic of the house and but i don't say that we're the only house that has that love i think that all houses have that i always just you see it more i don't know if all houses have that but you know other houses they have, have they have it. relationships yeah, like, it sounds like a great relationship so. but it definitely sounds the boot camp is what really for me as someone that likes looks at houses because I, I look at my family and ballroom two different like right. two different things and I look for in a house where they're going to push your pen for you like they're right. going to make sure that you come better for your category for people like That's me perfect. that people assume that oh you got it all together you you really love, you can't wait to be around people that actually want to be like no you can do this a little better yeah you know what I'm saying because you want to be better like I'm a like I'm a biggest fan of Beyonce like she always pushes her pen she always steps out of her box so and she's always growing and that's what I love to do for me so that was yeah because I want to live with, I want to live for my house kids my yeah, family yeah. like you know what I'm saying I don't want it to be fake if I'm sitting up the bitch and I'm like. <laughs> Okay, um, no, bitch. I want to live, like, bitch. Yeah, I know. I know they look good, bitch. I seen what they was coming out of, <laughs> like, bitch. I'm like, you know yeah, what I'm saying? So, but I it don't... feels so good, like, the, and and every time, like I said, it's just that love, cause I know that no matter what idea I have, they're gonna support it and they're gonna sharpen it. Yeah. It's not gonna be like, oh no, throw it in the garbage. You're not doing no. that. It's more, no, let's do it this way. This might be better. And then nine times out of ten. And that's not just in ballroom. It'd be shit that happens in my it's, personal it's life. It's pushing her confidence. You are how you it pushes in the house her confidence, group. too, I feel yeah, like. Yeah, it, it does. Like, yeah, it like makes her Stern, like things that she set. wouldn't <laughs> normally step out of the box with. Yeah. Like, no shade. She's like, like, even with this, she was like, I need you to show up, show up. Yeah. Like, put the professional hat away. This is just us talking. Yeah. And to continue to hear her push at that, I'm like, you know what? If this is the only place, because I keep saying, oh, we got to create safe spaces. Why not create my own where I could be around women who understand me and I could just talk my shit without having to censor right. or worry about how it's going to offend someone, but just talk about how I really feel about stuff without worrying about the consequences. And yeah. you can only do that in a safe space that will allow you to do those things. So thank you. I love you. Thank you. I yeah. love you, too. I love you, too. I love you, too. Yeah, okay. Now I'm outside. I want to love you shit. Let's get on talking about some shit. No. Okay, well, let's go. Y'all ready? Wait, but I want to know about because the ball just happened. We have some other things before we talk about topics. Well, oh, well, I went to Tokyo, of course. Oh, oh yes. 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 Tokyo. yes, it was amazing. It was the best. Honestly, it was the most fulfilling vacation, not vacation, but um, place I've ever been to where I was just blown away it was unreal it was unreal what um so what would like i see you eat your motherfucking lsi so Ooh. so Did you tap back in i felt it was the energy i'm a I mean, i'm an energy type of set so if the energy is right the best is gonna come out of me like and i can even go like baby it just comes out but to be honest 
for these past two years, I felt like defeated for a little second. I felt like unappreciated. I felt like I wasn't enough. And then I started to like, when I went there and I got that love, it was just like, and I mean, it was love. Like you felt it, like people were crying. It was just oh, like God. going crazy. And they, it was so, it kind of reminded me like, bitch, Asia, you, you know who you are? Like, you know what you gave? Like, but you know your power. It just reminded me of who I am. And I just, I needed that. So it was one of those things like, God did it at the right time. He put me on that trip at the right time. And honestly, at times we all experience that where we feel as though we're struggling against seeing our best selves. Mm. And then it's just something that kind of reinvigorates that. And you're like, oh, right. I am that bitch. I do have power. Yeah. You know, I can teach. I can educate. I can be all those things that I set out to be for myself. Yeah. And, and you're on that path. Like, yeah, it's like yeah. an alignment. Like, the steps are happening. Like, you know what I'm saying? Because mm -hmm. of but that's how you go. It don't be scary to you guys. No, like, I love that, this, though. That, it it's, do, like, do it's like it. confirmation. Like, it's like, oh, my God, it's happening. This is the way this is happening. Yeah. And the steps keep happening and happening. It's like, oh, my God. It's the like, blessings. And see, these things <laughs> that keep happening. See, y'all, I would say it's the blessings. Mm -hmm. Because you worked hard. You endured in your toughest time, and these are your rewards, right? And that's what yes. I love about it. Yes. It was the fact that it was like, I don't just, I didn't just come out there and win today. I worked my ass off in the scene, and you that's endured. what I loved about the ballroom. These individuals, you saw work. You saw, like, things that you can take out in the personal life, like work ethic, you know, creativity, like pushing so many things that you see in ballroom. And I'm not saying that we don't have that now. I'm not saying that. But it was just good to see and feel that energy of people don't mind. It's like they see your story. They love you. And I just also, you know, shout out to um, Leomi and Amari. And it was a couple other people, um, the icons. It was a couple people that really, when I was young, young girl, I saw Leomi going to places like you know, all over the world teaching. And I would have never thought it would be me. You know, I thought it was just, you know, whatever. I didn't shout think about it. But to see to that I'm, you know, I'm and doing Omari. that. Shout out to, you know, sis Leomi. Shout out to her and um, Amari. Like, I seen them. And he's one of my favorite dance, like, the teachers that teach Amari. Shout out to you so much, Amari. Like, like just your work ethic and how you teach. He teaches people how to be them. He don't teach them how to vogue or move like you. He kind of sees you in practice and he pulls, he wants you to do your best of your ability. You know what I'm that's saying? And fun. that's what I love. It's like, that's a teacher to me. Yeah. Those are greatness teachers. Yeah. <laughs> they I make stars. The greatness teachers. teachers. Yeah. Because wow. they teach stars. It's like, we can teach the whole room how to, you know, move like Asia. But, you know, like, I'm going to teach you how to be you. How to be the best version of yourself. And that's kind of like, okay. See, and that's the great thing, right? Because to be a leader, and that's something that always is thrown around, you got to first be led. Mm -hmm. And when you have people who see that greatness in you and they pour into you just because they see it and they know, mm -hmm. oh, this could be, and he goes and instead of telling them to be, you have to dance like me and move like me, I'm going to show you how to be the best version of yourself. Yeah. And we need more people like Omari. Yeah, shout out to him. Shout and I just, out to yeah. him. Shout out I'm to him. work with him. He's the choreographer of Cat. Yes. Yeah. Let's go. You see, Come that's on. also yeah, been the alignment and blessing for you as well. I've worked with him in a workshop. I love, I love, I love everything about him. It made me, it's so funny because um, I had never really like talked to him in full capacity before mm -hmm. the workshop. Or whatever. So I only seen like you know from a distance. I knew he was like very talented and stuff. But when I got in the workshop, I started realizing how much more he was too. Yeah. Like about like how he traveled like that and how mm -hmm. he was so trained in certain even music. Yeah, he like music and singing he, was his first thing he mm -hmm. was doing. Like so, there's a lot of things about him. He has so much depth to him mm -hmm. that I don't think it's even it, that could be celebrated more in um, ballroom. Yeah, you know we talked about that. Before. I wish that can be. I do wish that can be more celebrated and you know thank god you know i was fortunate enough to get love and praise when i go to the scene but there's some brothers and sisters of mine that they have done a lot of work and they still don't get the praise or they get shaded or because you feel like you're too good for them or do you hear these remarks or they felt like they should have got it i feel like these are the things that we should be praising these are this is iconic 
when you're going all over the world and you're getting people to the people love who you are you're teaching greatness i'm already seeing people like him and just i just be feeling like damn stop playing with them like mm -hmm. give them their, give them give them their roses like why we gotta take it but i think that happens for a lot i know sometimes when you have talents and gifts and you give out to the world it's a thankless thing Right? Mm -hmm. You're not going to always hear the affirmations mm -hmm. and like that thank you. And I always say that even in the work that I do, you're not going to always, it's a thankless job. Mm -hmm. You know, you got to really have a calling. So those, you know, those skills that we have inherited, you know, however we got them, yeah. right? We give them out. Omari's a, a, an amazing dancer, choreographer, Leomi, so many more that continue to push beyond the limits for ballroom. Right. And I think that that goes in any type of like when I think about Lolita, like other people who are out there in the arts doing things, trying to move themselves and the culture forward. It's amazing. And I do think that that stuff should be celebrated. You're absolutely right. And I think that we all felt like that at one time that we've given out and never really got the appreciation or the thing that we feel. And that's what I, I mean. Want, it's, endure. And sometimes it's not it's not just about being thankful. It's more about what you should get because mm -hmm. when it, it's a ball, it's a competition. You're exceeding the limit. Like you're a part of the growth of this community and where it's touching faces and who it's seeing. It's not about thank you. But it's about a round of applause. Like these people deserve oh, that. Like that's what I mean. Like it's a lot of things going on in this world within our community that we don't. We give legendary and iconic to people who don't deserve it, who barely even pushing their pen. But we not don't want to give someone a thank you because. That's yeah. That's in your. That's in your life. No, we should be applauding. These are the people that should be getting mm. trophies and awards. This is what we should be praising. And since we're thanking people, like cats, like, this is no, an listen, icon. Um, this is an icon that is doing. You didn't say we don't even have like a uniform like program or system. I mean, we have like awards balls and stuff like that. But like you talked about before, we don't even have like a, we should have like an award ceremony where it's not. A ball, like you it's know, in the it's words. just awards. Yeah, oh, that's gonna be cute. It's oh, and then, I think, yeah. and then I think that those things would, could be appreciated more. Like you know, you could celebrate people more in a different way. You know, and you push way. people to want to do more because it makes them want to do better. But since we're shouting and thanking people, I would be remiss if I didn't say kudos and shouts to Deshaun Levin. I was thinking about what I was saying earlier, and I was like, I should have shouted you out. So I'm shouting you out. Thank you for being my partner in the grand prize win this week. I knew that you was the person that we were going to execute this vision together. So thank you and shouts to you. Did he let you keep the bag? Girl, I knew you was going to try to <laughs> ask me that, girl. I had <laughs> to get it. She said, did he, did he let you keep that Birkin? <laughs> 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 that, was her, that was her birthday. <laughs> <laughs> that was mine. I'm sorry. No. But it was nice. I knew that that would have been a great duo. Actually, somebody else knew before I did. Oh, yeah. I said definitely walk with him. <laughs> oh, yeah. Like, and see, and that's with? what I mean. Like, that's like, what I mean. It was with? perfection. Like, yeah. It, Sean, like, it was would, perfect. Like, I was watching it. I was like, perfection. Like, you carried the way you stood there. Yeah. It was everything. Like, you, it was just confidence in you. Like, you know, here's mine. Thank you. Hi. Because like, you were laughing. Because <laughs> it's actually what and I like. Y'all looked so yeah. well together. So, um, she said it, though. Yeah, I thought, I thought that was going to be perfect. Um, yeah. I would guess um, today walks uh, legendary realness. Oh, I can't wait <laughs> to have that conversation. But, um, yeah, the conversation is be going to be a good conversation this person hasn't spoke since the incident that he ended up having to do time for mm. so i can't wait and speaking of like doing time i was thinking as far as like the prison system do you think because i remember the time that i was arrested and it was so horrible like um the part where they made me like strip naked and stuff in front of like all these guys and it was like the worst feeling ever or whatever and i was thinking do you think that there should always be a like separated dorm for gay and trans people or if you're like post trans like if you're post op should you be able to pick the gender that you now you know identify as or 
like should we just be in general population do you think it should always be like a specific dorm i personally do think that there should be a specific dorm because it could be and you should be able to choose or whatever because like yeah i think that's gets kind of scary as someone who was justice impacted i understand that for me i agree right i agree that they should have a choice right um, if you want to be in special housing, then you do special housing. If you want to do population, you got you can do population. But I think that you know, not saying that oh, we have like we're going to the Marriott Hotel and we get to pick what room service we want, but that should be afforded an opportunity. Like if we have to do the time, we shouldn't be repunished for doing the crime because we're already serving the time. So now it's just like you're putting us in these. Um, situations where we're traumatized while trying to serve time. So it's like this whole ceremonial degradation that happens internally and externally because of the prison industrial complex. Um, so I would say, um, cause this is kind of, it's, I think if you are post-op, you should definitely have that. I think you should be with this, this woman. Mm -hmm. Um, but I feel like if you're, you know, pre-op, I think you should definitely be um, with, you know, like with the guys. But with the guys. I didn't mean to say that. No, oh, special no, 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 no. With this special so, so. <laughs> you did that to me. Yo, what the fuck? <laughs> we gonna take that. Oh my God. No. We gonna take that. <laughs> No, 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 that's how you feel. I know. No, no, no. Just I didn't explain yeah. why. No, no, no. So, no. So I, didn't, I didn't mean to say it straight, you know, like that. But it was no chase up. Sorry. Um, so, um, I do feel like we should be in a special unit. Most, for the most time, I know I was in a special unit whenever I was in a situation like that. They put me in, like, PC, in protective custody they at first. You. Like, yeah. I had to make them take me out. Like, I was like, no. Like, I'm like, bitch, I... Feel like I'm going crazy here for 23 hours and everybody. Oh, yeah, so no, I, that wasn't, that's we wasn't, PC. went, no. Yeah. So yeah, I yeah. wasn't, in, we wasn't in PC. So I was in a, they had dorms where we were at. And each dorm, um, you can come out, you was outside, like you, not outside, but you was in your unit. The gay dorm. Especially. Yeah. Yeah, they got it in Atlanta. Well, they, it was special. Happening. They, it wasn't, it wouldn't say gay. They will put it us with, special housing. they will put us with the people who, who basically run it from the trade, who want to be. Right. And then the ones who have like special pro like problems going on. Mm. So, and just for the viewers, PC is protective custody. Yeah. And where protective custody constitutes you being in a section off area where you only come out your cell like about a certain amount of hours a day and engage with your other cell members or people who are held prisoner in a recreational space where there's TV tables, dominoes, whatever. And that's like the only time that you're actually able to engage with other people. And sometimes, like I said, that's like repunishing you. While you're there, I could not live in protective custody. Um, and I could not do special housing because it felt like that was like a little microcosmic world because I don't want to paint it out like because it's a safe space and that we have our own housing, that some of those things are not perpetuated in there as well from corrections. You know what I'm saying? It's now we're in this space, like this isolated space where they can do things and get away with it because nobody's going to be able to report out. Mm. You see what I'm saying? So this is where all the grievous systems and all of that stuff kick in at. And now you're waiting and you really can't get to the law library and stuff like you want to. So it has its pros and cons, but that's why I think that people should be able to have the choice. I chose to be in population because I wanted that free movement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think. Okay. Cool. Um, okay. I'll, the I'll, girls got stuck. What happened? <laughs> no, because it's like um, I hear like I haven't did crazy time, so I wasn't. I didn't go up, so I don't know what that's yeah, like. Yeah, I didn't. I don't either. know what that was. It's like. a lot different. You know, like even when you are going through like bookings or whatever, that whole it's a ceremonial degradation. Like they start to make they give you a number right away. They fingerprint you and then your family can find you through a number. So your family is already impacted. They give you a booking case number. So they try to already prepare you, especially if you're going upstate. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So it's a little mm -hmm. bit different where 
I don't want to say like you have a preference, like prefer the state rather than to the city. It's just like this whole ritual. And then they put you away on these spaces, which are like little plantation spaces up in the mountains. And it's just like you feel like you got away from the noise. So you kind of just get accustomed to like routine. And now it's just like this steady routine that you're doing every day. But um, that place was really depressing to me. It's the, I'm telling you, just like the, play, the fact that they will, will, they will give you a number. Like, I, I was still remember my I was, number. I wrote a book. I wrote a book in there. It was I called The Four Walls. I started it. It was called The What? The Four Walls. See? And look well, at that. It was Because it was, it was four called Trap. It was Trap, but it was like different cycles. I to make sure to take this. But I was like trapped in different. It meant, it didn't mean just trapped behind those like four walls. Mm-hmm. It meant like trapped different points, trapped in different parts of my life Mm -hmm. like always feeling like i was trapped somewhere until i made that decision to go ahead and i'm going to speak it into existence that y'all going to finish those books and and we're going to get those books out there because everyone keeps saying you know tell your story tell your story and sometimes we really have to write our stories out like when we talk about that whole process of that like one and like sometimes that pushes the creativity. That's like, I started would be crazy. to write more songs. <laughs> that's the way it would be when crazy. When I was in prison. So it's it's crazy. But like I said, taking it back to the number thing, and we'll get into that with the guests. Like I remember my number. Oh my you still remember that number? Yeah, because that's all you go what by. What was your number? My number was ninety seven eight seven six two four. That's oh that my was God. my number. I remember that, but that is the psycho trauma that happens when you're in there. See, I used to go by that number. But now I can say, Google me, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> she felt that. <laughs> she yeah. felt that. She was like, bitch. <laughs> now it's I can shimmy. say, yeah, I used shimmy. to say, yeah. You know, but that goes to show you. And our next guest will talk about that as well as you were saying. Yeah, so I think we should go ahead and bring the guests on. Let's yeah. go. <laughs> Our trans woman of the week is a devastating beauty, Cheyenne Aphrodite Allure, the overall mother of the house of Allure, one who used to set the ballroom on fire. She is also a dark chocolate beauty who inspired me and such generations to come after herself. We love you, Cheyenne, and thank you for all that you have contributed to this scene. And another woman we want to highlight for trans woman of the week, is Giselle Alessia Extravaganza. Thank you for all you do to lift the voices of the marginalized communities by your platform, when you, whether it's strutting on the runway or strutting in ballroom. You continue to raise the bar for runway and face. Thank you for your continued legacy with the House of Extravaganza. We honor you and we love you. Giselle Alessia Extravaganza. Welcome our guest, the legendary realness himself, undefeated big boy's face, just one of those people you would call a ruler, the legendary Carlos Chanel Ebony, the advocate, the let me, legendary, let me first of all say that he has not had an interview since this big incident we all remember that he ended up doing time for us. So this is an exclusive with the legend himself, Carlos Ebony. Yes! Woo! Oh my God, this is gonna be so good. Go. <laughs> thank you, thank wow, you, thank you. What's goody, hey, brother? What's going on, oh my God. Yeah, I want y'all to know this is my brother, like my brother, brother. <laughs> like, Blood wouldn't make yeah. us so close. So like this is you know um my big brother. Like we go way, way back. Oh, we were Chanel. Of course. We were Chanel's back in the day. And this man has always he comes from the gentleman. You know how we always talk about the girls don't seem like the girls are protected anymore and mm-hmm. stuff. Like, you know, the butch there was an era where, you know, the butch queens and gay men and our scene like protected yeah. us and stuff. This was <laughs> Definitely has always been my protector, baby. Sure. You couldn't say a motherfucking thing. <laughs> 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 yes, this is my brother. Yeah. Like I mean, we just was family. He protected me with my time. When I talked about doing a jail that time, real quick, mm-hmm. it was a little one jail. <laughs> <laughs> After it got dropped, but 
This one kept the book stacked for that little couple of weeks. My, my mother be like, that. oh, Lowe's put more money on you. Like, you know, he's yeah. always just been great in my life. But what's up, what's the up? legend? Are you still an Ebony? Are you still, are you? Well, you know, I, that was my house that I left when I left. You know, that when I went from my little hiatus. So, you know, I have not officially separated from the Ebony's or whatever. I still love my family. I miss them, you know what I'm saying? I, but I have been kind of a distance separated from them since I had this whole situation happen because I've been away. So got on. Okay, so to tell a little bit of history about Carlos, like he's been fathers of the House of Chanel, yes. the House of Ebony. Yes. Um, um, I was uh, the one who started the house in uh, Detroit. Detroit. I took over that house. That there. chapter was sick. Yeah, that chapter was <laughs> yeah. Proud, you know what I'm saying? Was and then I uh, became uh, Father Ebony in New York. I was going to take over the position in Atlanta because my brother um, Rashad, rest in peace, uh, Rashad had rest in peace, Rashad. Uh, was in his demise or whatever. And so, uh, but I decided, you know, so now I never was like, come to New York, we need you in New York, we need you in New York. So I came to New York and did a thing up there. And then this happened, so. Yeah. And you, happened. Before and I, we get into that thing, because Before we, we do, can I just say, I, I just want to give a little love, a little shout out to y'all, because I'm so proud of you, sis, for this whole thing. I mean, the three of you, the energy that you guys pour into this, the lady, I'm telling you something. First of all, I'm a fan of each one of y'all. Asia, listen. I've been a fan of you for a while. Really? And I really have. Oh. I have to say that. I sincerely say that. Not just because of you know, your talent and the way, you, the way you do your thing, but because of the fact that you put yourself into it. And I feel you carry yourself so classy and so ladylike. And it comes out mm. in your performance. And I've always been a fan of that. And I just want you to know that. Thank you. Oh, my God. <laughs> and so, and Tabitha, you as well. And the way you, you, you have a history and a story like mine. And again, we are connected by being our Aries. You know, I'm Muslim, but... We are, we connect like that. And I just always have appreciated your drive to be a person that is a leader and an activist, you know what I'm saying? And step up and speak up for our people and be so articulate with it, you know what I'm saying? And be a beacon for young people who can say, who want to follow in your footsteps. I always, I appreciate that. Thank you. And sis, <laughs> my, I'm telling you, when I, sat, when I saw the last show and I saw Shay Shay sitting here, and Shay Shay got choked up. I was at home and I was getting choked up because it's really, is, I mean, you know, We've it's been, been what? It's been, I can't even tell you how many years. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's been, been it's years. Been We've years. been through it all. From the beginning. <laughs> we <laughs> yeah, walked our first ball together. <laughs> yes, right? we went through it all. Nike Pavilion? Nike Pavilion. Oh, that was your first one too. Oh, oh my God. Like, we, we started come with our first original houses together. <laughs> Yeah. Then we became a lawyer together. We became a lawyer together. I think we did. Oh, yeah. we my moved goodness. up here. Yeah. We lived up here. Yeah. We've been through a lot we together. Did. So we this did. is one of my people. And I want to say to that, I wanna, I've never probably said this to you or whatever, but I choose to take this moment. I like, we're going to talk about this. Yeah, we're going <laughs> to talk about the um, elephant in the room, which is, you know, the case that you just did 10 years for. Yeah. Um, at the time, me and you weren't as talking as much. We had kind of fell out around that time. Yeah. Like, yeah. we wasn't, like, we, we wasn't, like, talking, like, how we had been talking because whatever situation. And so, at, and I was in my, you know, oh, you know, when, to, when he comes back around, you know what I'm saying, in that right. stage. And when you started going through this trial thing, I was not there right. like I had right. should have been. Right. And I apologize to you Ooh. for that. Like, I wrote letters and stuff behind the scene, but we wasn't talking. It should have been to the point where I was, like, trying to find out more from you. Right, right. Like, and I know that you feel like the community has kind of let you down in a way. Like, I hear you kind of say a little bit about, yeah. you know, sp you, could, you could speak to that. Yeah, you know? absolutely. Um, first, let me say what, what means more to me is that you said that. And you have, me and you have discussed this before mm -hmm. because I reached out. We reached out when I was away. And we reconnected. And, right. you know, our bond is a lifetime bond. So yeah. there may have been times where you haven't been there. And there may have been times that I wasn't there for you. And I was really more concerned about me going away and not being able to be there for you in the way that you needed me to be there for you because of the fact that, you know, I was one of the only male figures in your life at the time. You know what I'm saying? In the ballroom and outside, you know what I'm saying? That, you know what I'm saying? Because you don't have a lot of it. I said, you know, there were things that I had gone through that... Uh, had finally caught up to me. Unfortunately, I had a tr very, very traumatic and troubled childhood, and I don't mm -hmm. want to really go into that, but some of the things that happened, I repressed, and they came back on me during my adulthood, and I wasn't able to deal with it, and I think that it, it caused me mm -hmm. to really go through a lot of changes, and I think that you couldn't, at the time, and I don't know why we're talking, this is something so personal to start off with, but you couldn't process it, or you couldn't witness it. 
You know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? And then you had to step back because of your love for them. And um, I understood that. And that's why I said, like I said, I love you. You know, you're my baby sister. You know what I'm saying? Like I can't oh see. Oh my God. So I'm being away from you like that, you know what I'm saying? So it's never something that, you know, you have to worry about. I mean, I, everything happened the way it happened. It wasn't yeah. really nothing you could do. But I appreciate you saying that, honestly. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about what happened. People are probably like, what happened? But this was like in 2015. Um, yeah. Um, the, the, the situation surrounding the incident was the fact that, and just let me give a little bit of background of who I was before. I have been an activist and, a, and an advocate in the community Absolutely. in HIV and AIDS awareness and prevention for as long as I can remember, for 20 years. I've worked with some of the CBOs across the country. And um, I'm legendary father of a ballroom house, you know what I'm saying? So when I'm going into this, going into this situation, the night of this incident, and it happened, uh, Cinco de Mayo, which was May 5th of 2015, the incident occurred at a restaurant in uh, the city. And, there, and there's, a, there's always been, there's been a lot of talk about it since then. It's like I said, this is my first time talking about it. But- um, We can't say the restaurant? I don't, I don't want to because I, I understand that I'm going into this with the fact that this case is not over. Okay. I'm still adjudicating this case in court, you know okay. what I'm saying? and I'm still yeah. fighting for my exoneration. I still have a case that's pending in federal court based upon this because I feel like my trial was unconstitutional. And because of that, there are certain things I can't say because this case may very well be retried. Mm -hmm. so there are certain things I can say and can't say. So I don't want to, and because of the fact that you know, this particular establishment may be may come up for libel, and I, I want to be careful about what I say about them as well. Mm -hmm. But we know which one it, uh, it was, right. and I'm sure that I everybody- I just want to say, work. even with all of that, thank you for oh. being here. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank, thank you for you. having me here. Yeah. This is the perfect space for me to have had my first interview, because I have been staying away. You know, and, and you know, there have been, you know, a young man had wrote a book about my case, and uh, he reached out to me while I was incarcerated and asked me about it. And I, I gave him a bit of a quote for the book and everything. And he, he mentioned me and mentioned me in the credits. But I was apprehensive about it because of the fact that I was in a maximum security prison and because of the fact that the people in the prison, I was not openly gay in prison. You know what I'm saying? I, I, don't, I don't identify as that in, you know, in that area because of the fact that it is a dangerous situation, especially because of the fact that I am a Muslim and I practice Islam. And so uh, walking that line, having to walk realness for the amount of time that I was there kept me alive because they would have, I could have been killed. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's one of the things that I, I, I've always had to contend with. I had to contend with whether or not my story would get out when the books were published and, and, and they, the books were given to, to the prison. They had, I had to get the books taken out of the library, you know, have people sneak in and get the books out of the library because I didn't want them to read it, you know. So it was, a, it was a difficult thing, you know, to even navigate that. So it's a lot, it's, it's a lot of nuances to the story, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, and because there's so many I want so much like I wanted to go to about that. I remember you telling me the things that you witnessed in prison and how you know people are treated, and let alone the like trans and gay people and stuff, and how taboo it is Absolutely. to even talk to them. And it, stuff. It, it, it it really is, and and I I, I really don't want to. I, I kind of want to. Before we get into that, I really kind of want to jump ahead because, like I said, a lot of people who have not ever heard the story. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm sorry. I've That's never uh, don't understand what happened, and I think a lot of things that were false narratives that were publicized and, yeah. and, and sensationalized by the media were a part of the reason why my case was not tri tried fairly, and. Um, that's some of the things I want to address. I had left home that night. I was on my way to a breast cancer event. A friend of mine, his mom works for a company that offers the event every year. We went to Chelsea to go to the event. It was a formal event. I was in a tuxedo. You know, it was a formal event. We went down. We had a good time. We left. Uh, a couple of colleagues of his, a friend of his, we had left and went to this restaurant to have some food. While we were in the restaurant, there were two men in the restaurant who were drunk. And they had an altercation with one another. And that altercation spilled out to another table where the women were afraid. So. As a man, I spoke up and said, hey, guys, there's ladies here. Plus, these were older ladies of color. So I just, and these were, these gentlemen were white. And so um, when I said something, I think the onus was put on them because they were fighting with each other because they were trying to run out of the restaurant. And they were trying to rerun out because they were trying to not pay for their meal or whatever they had. Oh my God. And so the guy came over and he hit me in the head. He didn't push me. He didn't say anything. Just hit me in my face, hit me inside of my head or something. I didn't know what he hit me with, he rocked me. 
I'm six, eight, and 400 pounds. People don't really hit me. You know what I'm saying? And if somebody does hit me, I have to contend with the fact that this person is either crazy or out of their mind suffering some type of mental illness. <laughs> they either have a weapon, a gun, or a knife that they can get right. out on me. Or they're drunk or they're, they're drunk or something going on. Either way, I have to know this person can't be in their right mind to put their hands on me. So I'm not Superman, but I know that people don't normally hit me. So when he, when he did, <laughs> and he stood and stood, you know what I'm saying? Long story short, he reached on the table and he grabbed one of the utensils off the table and put it behind his back like he was going to stab me with it. And the guy was given a direct path to me by the manager because the manager kind of backed everybody up and I saw it. So I had a female with me. I had a woman with me at the time and I was worried about her. I was worried about my safety. I was worried about the safety of the people I was with. And so I threw a chair at them. And they gave me nine years for the chair. They didn't get to sustain any substantial injuries. They didn't get hurt. They didn't go to the hospital. They weren't seen at that night. They, didn't, they, didn't, they, were, they refused the ambulance. They left with a free meal. And I got charged with attempted first-degree assault, meaning that I intended to do deadly bodily harm against these men. Oh. And which made matters worse is that they decided after the incident to sensationalize this lie that I was a homophobic gay basher and that I stomped them and I called them racist, homophobic names as I was stomping them. They assumed that I was straight, obviously. And uh, they, they basically uh, made up this big story. There was someone in the restaurant who had filmed it on his video, you know, on his, uh, on his uh, cell phone. And he took the cell phone footage and took it home and doctored it and he only cut the part where I threw the chair and looped it. And it went viral. He put it on his blog and it went viral. Millions of hits everywhere. It was on the news everywhere. Someone mentioned it to the governor. He said something about it. That's when Cuomo was governor at the time. Somebody mentioned it to de Blasio. He was mayor at the time. He said something negative about it. And think the stage was set because marriage equality had just passed. Uh, gay pride was on his way here. People were, thousands of people were coming here and they wanted a cause. They wanted, it was the perfect storm for something like this to happen. A homophobic gay basher has come down to Chelsea, the heart of the gay community, and they have just hit these poor couple with this, you know, trying to kill this poor couple. So it was a reason to rally. And because the, and I want to speak about this later, the polarization between the LGBTQ community and the, unfortunately, the distance between the white community and the black you can and say Latino it. community. Mm -hmm immediately they rallied behind these white men and took their narrative as truth. The governor went, spoke out against me. The mayor spoke out against me. The Democratic State Senator Brad Horman, who's, I don't know if he's still acting state senator, the councilman from Chelsea led an anti-hate rally and marched people to the restaurant and brought these guys out like they were heroes. And the restaurant even said, put a big poster board in the window and said, we don't condone anti-LGBTQ, LGBTQ, uh, violence, we, you know, we, we don't condone this type of behavior. We're going to find this attacker and bring justice for these victims. Because the night it happened, once I threw the chair, I grabbed the girl I was with and I, ran, I came about the restaurant because she was a friend of my friends who I went down there with. Because I needed to get away. We needed to get away. Right. So, amazing. long story short, it went to trial. There was a lot of things that happened in my trial that were unconstitutional. There were things that happened that were biased because of the fact that I am who I am. And when they found out my last name is El Amin and that I'm a practicing Orthodox Muslim, uh, you know, it Jeez. fit the narrative that this person was a, you know, a homophobe because there was a lot of Islamophobia playing at the time as well. And um, that played a lot into uh, my case. Uh, the media's coverage, they had me actually on the cover of the newspaper with the Twin Towers behind me saying a towering terror. You know what I'm saying? And, you know, it was just, oh it, was a whole, it was a whole thing. And so I was sentenced disproportionately. I was given nine years, although I had never had been convicted of a violent crime in my life. Uh, I had never been convicted of a crime here. I had, not, I had not had a charge against me in 20 years. I think I had a misdemeanor back in something that was not even a, uh, a felony here years ago. And um, there was no prosecution for them. There was no, they wouldn't even allow me to uh, ch press charges against them or even si sign a statement against them. I went to the police because the police said, we saw the footage from the restaurant come in and give your statement. I went in and they arrested me. They didn't allow me to do that. They violated my rights. And you know, in, 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 our, in our country, we have a certain thing called equal protection on the law, which is the 14th Amendment. If they were able to press charges against me, I should have been able to press charges against them, and they didn't allow that. 
and they never went to jail. They spilled my blood. They never were, you know, prosecuted for that. But unfortunately, I was. And, yeah. and see, hearing your story, and I remember your story, but I was also incarcerated when it happened. Um, it's so fucking heartbreaking when we think about how society has significance over white lives as opposed to black lives, especially black queer lives. Because before they saw your identity, all they saw was the Tower of Terror. Absolutely. Right? They saw a black man. And, and, and I, I want to just say, and I got you off, but I just want to say that if the situation was reversed, let's just say this guy, he, what his narrative was that he heard us call someone a homophobic slur because he said they spilled their drinks at their table and we said look at those f's over there spilling drinks this we, he said he heard that from awesome. our general vicinity so he walked over this is what he said in the media he walked over and said what did you say and i just jumped up and started beating him but let's just say this was this happened in reverse if i as a man my size my stature my color had gotten up and walked over this table and put my hands on him for something that he th that I thought he said, he could have shot me and got away with it. Mm -hmm. If it was a situation, he could have he said, that big dude came over here and bust me in my head with something and I thought he was gonna kill me and I, I shot him. Mm -hmm. And he could have got, he wouldn't have, he wouldn't have done a day. You know what I'm saying? But, but here I am, the one in prison. Question. And not only just being in prison, but being, because I really want to lean into that, right? Of your identity as a queer Muslim. Yes. Right. Yeah. To be inside an institution that doesn't allow. And you know that I know it's like we are like the subhuman of subhuman within that microcosmic world. And we're treated like you won't you can't talk to the girls. You can't you will get hurt, physically hurt. And if you act out on your intention, you also get a ticket and then you go to the box if you act on your intentions. Right. So. Being that and having that identity and being a queer Muslim, how was that for you inside the penitentiary? You were just, ha you had all these egregious charges against you. Now you're in jail and can't even just be yourself in there. Well, that's a difficult question to ask because I feel like I am happy that I had the community that I had, the sense of community that I had, the brothers that I had in there, even though they didn't know the truth about me, even though if they had found out about me, um, I would have had to contend with fighting for my life. And that's just the reality of the situation. One of the brothers who were in, was in there with me recently was just uh, almost killed. And I just found this out when I was sitting in the parole office because one of the Muslim brothers that I go to, go to, we go to the same parole office and I saw him and he was in Clinton with me. He said, um, and by the way, they put me in a maximum security prison with guys too, with life without, too. guys with 150 me years. Too. They put me in there and I, and I had never even been in prison before. So. People who ain't got nothing to lose. Right. No, and me too. So, you know, I, this, wow. one of the, he had just told me that one of the brothers was caught giving food to a trans uh, girl that was um, in, in, that he, I guess, favored. And when they found out about it and they stabbed him up, this just happened recently. So, you know, it is what I, what I really, really want to convey to people to understand, no matter how many initiatives they say they have started, black, trans, and queer people are not safe in New York state prisons. I can't speak on prisons anywhere else because I haven't been there, but in New York state prisons, in the maximum security prisons that I was in, in the hmm. medium that I was in, and the, the general consensus is they are not safe. They are not safe. At all. We are not you safe. Are, you, I don't care. This, this narrative that people think about what happens to pedophiles or people who have committed crimes against women or rapists or whatever, that they are somehow abused or hurt in prison is not the case. Mm -hmm. The worst thing you can be in prison is trans. The worst thing you can be in prison is gay. And that is the truth. That is the truth. You cannot be seen talking to them. I could get hurt for even talking. If I'm Muslim, I can be hurt for even talking to them. Yes. Even being seen, having a conversation with them. And, and, or much less being any type of innuendo or thing, something like that. It could mean your life. Question. Being that it may, like being that that is the case outside of that, how do you deal with your sexuality and being Muslim? I'm gonna answer that question. 
I want to get an Asian question too because she's listening real quiet. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I want to go ahead. Go ahead, Um, I just wanted to more so ask, how do you feel? How do you feel about all of this? Like, how do you, how does all of this make you feel as an individual? I've gone through different waves of feelings. Um, there have been a, there's been a lot of loss. You know, I lost a lot of my life. Um, I lost, you know, loved ones, family members, my mother succumb to cancer while I was away and I wasn't able to go to her funeral or even mourn her death because, you know, mourning is being crying or walking around and that kind of disposition is seen as a, as a weakness and they prey on the weak, you know, yes. and so I couldn't even mourn my mother's death. Um, I lost my nephew, who was uh, killed to gun violence um, a few months ago um, and I, I've just recently gotten home. Um, and uh, also too, uh, my trans daughter that was killed um, in Atlanta, uh, shot in the head, I don't know if you know Coco. And, yeah, um, and, oh, uh, that's where I knew her from. That was your daughter. Yeah. yeah. And like, then my brother Jahar was, like my brother Jahar was killed as well. Jahar, so um, I, I took a lot of losses. So it was it, it 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 was difficult not to fold up and become angry or bitter because I would have wanted retribution, you know. And there's no there's no evening out justice for me at this point. You know, monetary value didn't give me justice. I mean, I lost more than they could ever give me back. Jesus. And so I had to turn inward and find my purpose and say to myself, to whom much is given, much is expected, um, and know that I have always been a leader and I've always been a person who has advocated for people in my life and, and been my best when I've been in service to others. So I decided that to best service myself, that I should try to give back to the community. And that's why I'm here now, because I want to shine light on what happened with these people and the plight of what they're going through there so that I can get some help for them. And also some of the people who have helped me during this situation. Um, granted, you and I were not around each other, but believe me that I had people who had came around and, and did uh, rally and, and advocate for me, uh, people from the ACLU, uh, people from Black and Pink, but particularly, in particular, an organization called F2L, it's called Fight to Live, and it was started um, by uh, a good friend of mine who's become a person who's become a good friend of mine. They are gender non-conforming, their name is Mitchell Mora, and yeah, they, Moore. their yeah. pronouns are they, them. And uh, they saw my case, came to the jail where I was, and immediately jumped into action. Uh, F2L is a network that is a nonprofit organization now that has raised hundreds of thousands of dollars for people incarcerated. I'm saying strictly for people incarcerated. The money, the 100% of the proceeds that they are, they are given go directly to people who are in the network, who are incarcerated, who, who need things. And, and, and you know, like I said, the plight of the trans people and gay people in prison, they are isolated. They are not, you know, a lot of them don't have family. A lot of them don't have friends that were able to give them anything. And, you know, they need you know, a gender inferred clothing, commissary, cigarettes, some food, something like that. It's easy for them to go in debt because the one thing that they can be talked to about is drugs. Like, you, you know, if, you, if you're straight, you can sell them drugs. That's the only thing you can talk to them about. But they get strung out on debt and they either turn into sex work or something like that or they get hurt because they can't. Sex pay. work in the jail? Oh, they get turned out. Like, you, guys, you know, got some, you got some guys. I'm saying, like, like Listen, right, you got yes, some this is why I said care. if you is, act on your intentions, you can get in trouble. I know that. I know that right? So no, 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 no. Yes, you can. Right? I thought you were just sleeping around. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> sometimes, <laughs> like sometimes, like you will get into debt and you will owe someone, and because they're not out to everyone, they will have you do something for them later on when no one else is. And around. it's violent. It's not something that's really sexual. It's violent. You know. What right. I'm these people are being. These people are being hurt. Honestly, I'm, I, I can't. I honestly can't tell you how difficult it is to have seen this and witnessed it and not be able to do or say anything. So I started, you know, uh, clandestinely sneaking and talking to them and getting their information so that Mitchell could get them the Thank help you. that they need. And I would slip, they would slip me their dead number and everything and I would get them, give it to Mitchell and Mitchell put them in the network to make sure they get money in their commissary accounts. And I did this for a number of people that came through, young, the young people that came through. And, and, it, and it helped and it gave me a sense of, helping them. And now they're part of the network and they talk, Mitchell talks to their families and you know, they are really um, getting some assistance, but they need more. They, they need more, you know, because we survive, or the, the network survives off of the kindness and the, the help that we get 
from other organizations. And uh, they're just in need of help. I mean, just for, I mean, legal help, you know, a lot of, you know, monetary help, you know, and, and I just want to be able to say that uh, it is a, it's, a, it's a tireless and thankless job and, and they're doing it just because of the fact that they care. And I really want to get them some help that they need. I thank you Mitchell. for mentioning them. Yeah, I met yeah. Mitchell as well. Mitchell's yeah. amazing. And the first time that I met Mitchell as well was for a similar incident with um, a young lady in community who had something happen to her and she had some yeah. complications as a result of, right. you know, the assault from police. Right. Um, or the correction officers and immediately they had reached out to a former organization that I was with and we did it was you're right it's rapidly we jumped right into it and we was like literally in front of the jail advocating for justice advocating for them to be removed from that jail and in response she actually was removed from that jail and brought closer to home where her family can access her her. and she got out so you know who I'm talking about but we're not going to mention her name here but Thank you for bringing those things up. Those things speak true. And also the thing about like seeing these injustices but not being able to do anything, right? And there are times when you said that and I think that there are times when I wish that someone was there like that when I was navigating the system because as I like I had to defend myself. So when you said that the sense of community Right. Like we leave our communities and then we're stripped of that and we're thrown in these spaces where we have to form some type of community. Absolutely. And, you know, I became very violent because I only had myself. And when you say that, I remember that. Like I didn't have a, 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 a faith that I could, you couldn't even be a part of the Christian church and talk to us. Right. Like really? even when we, no. Everything was kind of like subsect. If you were Christians and y'all went to church all the time, I always used well, to say this. Well, who decided that part that the Christians Listen, I always used them? to say this. It depends on what judge you, because when he said Clinton, I remember when I was in Clinton. And once you hit Clinton, once you go to the yard, it's a sand trap. Yeah. It's nothing but a sand trap. Yeah. And the what phones are all on. Like, it's just like you're on the beach. It's oh. a sand trap. Okay. It's just sand everywhere. And then you have like these makeshift ovens that looks like a big junkyard. And then you can tell the people who live there the longest because their yard has tiles on it. Oh, my God. And it's designed. They have cats, the old man who feed the cats in the Not yard. the cats in the yard. Yeah, all of that. Yeah. So it's kind of, you start to get exposed to this, and violence happens immediately. You're in the max, C-max. It's like you're behind the wall of another wall. Well, speaking so of that, it. like um, because of the plight Sorry. of the trans people and the gay people, um, we talked about earlier, do you think there should be like a separate dorm for people you know who are gay and trans. I I, I have to say that um, if it was a situation that it would help them, then I'd be for that. I understand. I mentioned that with Tab. I heard what Tabitha <laughs> said earlier about some of the things that could possibly uh, arise if they were put together, and some of the things that would, and, and that is a good point. However, um, I think that the safety, if for just from a safety standpoint, if I could get you away from somebody that I know would kill you, if I can get you away from somebody who I know hates you just because they want to hate you and would hurt you just because of that, if I can separate you from them, then I would want to separate you from them. Right now, there is legislation in New York, uh, and it's called the uh, Gender Identity Respect, Dignity, and that's, Safety Act. Right, that's being lobbied in it's, Albany it's right now. It's being lobbied right now, and I think it's a 709 a uh, lawmakers are being asked to pass this bill because it is going to preemptively assign housing to people according to their gender identity and, uh, and force or require, I should say, uh, jails and prisons to recognize a person for their gender identity as they are and respect their pronouns and give them gender affirming clothing and gender affirming toiletries and things of that nature and also not allow them to be placed in a segregated housing for more than 30 days based upon their, because a lot of times when what's happening now is if, if there's a situation where uh, some of these trans women are being, saying that they are in, in danger, they're being placed for an indefinite amount of time yes. in segregation. Oh, like and it's just like they're being imprisoned right, for being, being, just said, in you're fear, being retried. you know, and that that's something that can't happen. But if it's a situation where they are given the their own equal their own housing and they are able to have access to all the facility and the things that they need, then then I think that it would be better 
than to having to than having to worry about being hurt because somebody's just trying to make a name for themselves, or you know they think you said something, they think you looked at them the wrong way, and that's the problem. And uh, hopefully, some type of legislation comes out that would help um, the queer community as well because they are just as you know uh, oppressed. In, in, oppressed and in danger. Yeah, you know, and and and, and, the, and the mindset. And unfortunately, you know, some of the women. And I just want to say this: some of the women are not allowed to get. Um, their uh, hormones that they should have. Nope. Uh, they give them, technically they're supposed to give them hormones, but they're only giving them the smallest, smallest amount, dose. the smallest dose, just to say they're giving them something, but it's nothing that's, not go that's going to further them along. And they see themselves reverting back to, you know, uh, their, their former right. selves, you know, with, the, with, you know, growing the facial hair or not being able to have the, you know, just products to help, oh, you right. know what I'm saying? And, it, and it's just, it's a terrible mental you know, to have Mind to deal with that and then have to deal with. And here's the thing, like, they'll tell you and they'll use <laughs> language like, we're not language. here to help you transition. You're in the man's, um, you're in the man's detention center. And that's what they would say. And that would justify them not upping your dosage. Yeah, they, um, they don't care. They it's yeah, it's yeah. just, it's, you're treated really bad. I, I really want to like, just like, the whole prospect of being a queer Muslim, how do you intersect that now okay. being home? So, so this is a question that has been put to me a few times because I, I'm, I'm sort of an anomaly when it comes to this. Um, I don't think that I am alone. Um, I know that I'm not alone when it comes down nope. to this because, you know, uh, it's said that there's 24% of our population, 24% 24 of the world's population are Muslim, 1.8 billion Muslims in the world. So I can't be the only one, obviously. And I know that I have contended with this throughout my life. How do I sit at this intersection of being a man of color, being a, a Orthodox Muslim, and being a person that, you know, that yeah, identifies as being queer? It has been different throughout my life. And you know, I've stood at different parts of this intersection at different times in my life. Uh, what I will say is that I believe what I believe because Islam is the religion that I was born into, is the religion that I knew, it's a religion that has always given me peace. I have found peace in the religion and not because of some of the things that are, I would say, negative or some of the things that would necessarily uh, hurt other people, but because of the, the purity of the faith, because we are taught that every life has reason and every life should be respected. And I think that men have twisted a lot of the things in the doctrine to fit their own narrative and have made it appear that it should be that Muslims oppress other people and we shouldn't. You know, um, as a matter of fact, the lawyer who was instrumental in uh, my amicus brief during my appellate, his name is Gabriel Arkless. Uh, he's also on the board. You know Gabriel. <laughs> Gabriel sits Gabriel on the board. Gabriel changed uh, my name when oh, I was did. in the. Oh yeah. wow! Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Gabriel sits on the board of an uh, 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 organization that he's Muslim, and there's an organization that, um, that uh, it's called Masjid. It's uh, the uh, Muslims Against Sexual and uh, Gender uh, di I mean, Muslims for Sexual Gender Diversity, and so. Uh, they openly profess to being in the culture or in queers and trans community. However, they are practicing Muslims. And there are Muslims that are like that, you know what I'm saying, as well. You know, again, my brother Jihad, mm -hmm. you know, God rest his soul. And he, um, he was, you know, Muslim. And, you know, he was the only person that I really had. My brother Tanae also, um, you know, Tanae is Muslim. Yes. And Hanif is Muslim. Yeah, exactly. I have two questions Jihad. for you. Rest in peace, Jihad. I have two questions for you. So after experiencing this, like, and, and finally having your opportunity to say, to add your piece to the story, right? Mm -hmm. um, what would you like to see change? What do you think the community would benefit from hearing this? And what is your call to action for that? Well, um, right now, if I had a number of things would, would change, uh, I think that uh, in the onset of this happening, we as a community, as not only just the Baldwin community, but the LGBTQ community of color, of, of, of black trans people, of um, uh, Latino, black and trans people, we all need to rally when something like this happens, when, when we are being hurt 
we need to recognize it. When someone in our, from our community is being hurt, we need to recognize it. It was instinct the way that the white community rallied for these men without even knowing the narrative behind the story, without getting the truth yeah. about it, without letting the police investigate it. They immediately came to their aid from the highest, from politicians, from the highest politician in, the, in, in this state on down, you know, and we don't do that for our people. And it's a situation where people are going, uh, you know, to prison for disproportional sentencing, uh, things that they just could have probably beaten, but they didn't have the proper legal counsel. They didn't know what to do, what to say. We need some sort of uh, community. And this is why I said I'm so excited and so passionate about the work that F2L is doing, because they're not just they're not just sending commissary money. It's a network that they are trying to make sure that we get the proper uh, a network of lawyers and a network of organizations that can help people and their families when situations like this arise and pack the courts for them and let them know that we ha they have a community behind them. And it's not just one lone person uh, that is uh, out there by themselves or whatever. Unfortunately, you know, the, the F2L actually got its or or origins when uh, there was a couple um, I went to CC, they were a Latino couple and um, they were sex workers and um, they had a situation where they were with um, a particular, in a particular instance with someone and the guy had, um, he was a white guy and he had been known for um, wanting younger people or whatever, you know, and these were young people and he had had situations like that before and he liked to be asphyxiated and he died during the situation and, and during the session or whatever they had. And, you know, it was portrayed in the media that they killed him and they, you know, you know they were just roasted behind it. And, and they both received 25 years of life and they're both in prison right now oh still. And they were, you know, in their early 20s when this happened. And they were, you know, uh, they tried to resuscitate him. They tried to help him, but, you know, they were afraid as kids. They were afraid in a situation like this being taken advantage of and being exploited themselves. So, you know, the the judge in this case didn't allow for them to say anything about this man's character and how he had been you know what i'm saying they didn't want to say anything about how this man's kink was or whatever you know what i'm saying and they just went away because of it you know and and that's the way that's how f2l actually got its initial start and this was right like nine months before my case happened so these hoteps need to hear these stories and hear your stories where they automatically think yes. that there's a privilege with being gay and that somehow your color is not seen first. Like, you know, and the separation between the white and gay, like the white and black gays, like they're going to rally together, whereas we'll sit back and probably be like, oh, what you think was wrong? Like, we, we ready to judge. We ain't ready. We ready to find out the story and make Get sure, you know, you ready uh -huh. to bring yeah, the they want down. To they ready to Instead the person of just down. Rallying Instead of rallying behind the yeah, yeah. yeah. And I will say that, <laughs> yeah. I will say that, once I was sent, once I was convicted, because that's when people start finding out. People started finding out what was going on yeah, with me. But understand that this incident happened in May of 2015. I didn't get convicted until May of 2016. It was a whole year of narrative of things that could have been said about my character and who I was as a person and of the life that I lived and how I was in service to my community before I got sentenced. And you know, I, I remember days of my mom sitting out in the in, in the uh, courtroom by herself. You know, and so. <laughs> I wish that uh, my community had shown up for me a little bit more at that point because, and, I, and, and just for the, for the emotional support that I needed also because I didn't know what was happening. I was a deer caught in the headlights. You know, you, you trust the lawyer and you think that this lawyer is going to, you know, uh, aid you and, you know, you don't know anything. And, I, and unfortunately, I was, uh, I was given an 18B lawyer. Um, no, New, York has a, New York has a... Uh, rule that you know a certain uh these certain amount of hours have to be given back to the state by attorneys and law, law offices and they send their kind of worst lawyers to take care of that you know to do this kind of pro bono work mm. or whatever and the ones with the worst track record and i happen to have gotten a, a person who was completely unprepared for trial when it came to me he even stood up in the courtroom and said that he was not prepared and you know um it, it played you out. You felt railroaded. It did. It did. And <laughs> unfortunately, it, it played out in the appellate process because if you don't, this is one thing that people should know, and I just want to say this one last thing about this case before I, because I said I wasn't going to talk too much about it because, again, 
I'm writing a book about this. Um, when you are in a situation like that, if something happens to violate your rights in a courtroom, it has to be objected to. It has to be put on record and objected to by your attorney or it didn't happen. So if something happens where the prosecutor says something or does something or a witness says something or does something or there's a problem with the jury or there's a problem with the judge, if your attorney or you don't stand up and say objection and put it on record that you're objecting to it, it cannot be brought up in your appellate, in your, in your appellate uh, review. It cannot, you cannot mention it. It's just like it didn't happen because it wasn't objected to. But if you're sitting there and you just depend on your lawyer and you're like, you know, well, I'm going to say something. how they You know, and it. you think something happened wrong and you know all of these things that happened that was really a violation of your rights. You can't even, the appellate, the appellate uh, uh, courts won't even listen to it. But here's so. the thing. But some of them, the 18B lawyers and those lawyers kind of make you feel like if you are a young teen who gets locked up, you don't, you know, learning the law and the protections that you have is not something that you immediately know. So you're totally dependent on this lawyer who does not object to those things in the court. Because, like, you're sitting there and you're just trying to get out and you just wanting to believe that everything they're going to say is in your best Absolutely. interest. Meanwhile, you're hearing stuff that you know don't sound right, but you can't say anything. You know, and that's just like the whole system in itself that kind of keeps us trapped behind these walls. And I call it like from schools to the prison pipeline. It is. And, it's, and a it's a system that continues yeah. to target marginalized communities, especially trans and, 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 and queer populations. They, they, they go there. They know where we're at. And they target us in these ways. And they leave us defenseless because we probably didn't know. And that's why it's important that you continue to use your voice, mm -hmm. Carlos, sure. so that they people will know. Right, I was just having a conversation about pretrial freedom, yeah. right? And I asked you about that. Like, yeah. did you have the benefit or the opportunity to actually bail out? Because when they give you these high bills, not only are you impacted, I sat here and watched this interaction. Your arrest impacted your family. It did. And what it did. how have like how would have pretrial freedom helped you? Well, let me just say that the narrative is that, you know, uh, queer and trans people of color are more disproportionately criminalized, uh, unfairly, uh, disproportionately sentenced, and we face what we face in the prison mm -hmm. system. It's a pipeline, and it's a beast, and the beast has to be fed. Being in the belly of the beast means that that's exactly where you are. Mm -hmm. In my particular uh, incident, there was a botched, uh, it, was, it was botched in, in, in the entire process of the investigation process. And the narrative was that I was a, again, homophobic gay basher who was out to hurt these people. And even when the NYPD re pulled the surveillance footage from the restaurant the day after the incident, and they saw that this man came and attacked me, they didn't change that narrative in the media. They let the media go on with it. Because this case became so hot, the hate crimes, because of these allegations that this man had made against me, the hate crimes unit investigated it. So the media, the media kept portraying that this was being touted as a hate crime. And even though this hate crime unit, when they realized that it wasn't, when they found out who I was, when they realized who I was after speaking to certain people, and they knew and they saw the footage and they knew it wasn't a hate crime, they didn't push this onto just a regular assault. They kept the case. And they, they, and they kept the narratives going that it was being, uh, being looked at by the hate crimes unit, and it was being spun that way. So it made me look like a homophobic gay basher. It also didn't help that the uh, Robert Boyce, who at the time was the lead detective at NYPD, got on a press conference and said that I was a violent career criminal who had most likely fled the state because of the fact that I was not around. But when I left the restaurant and I left, and I realized that I needed to get legal counsel. And I had a situation where at the time I was taking care of my godfather, who's much older. He's like in his uh, late 70s, early 80s at the time. I did not come directly to the police in this situation. And I always said to myself, I know there's a camera over my head. If something was to happen, that if this was something, I know they're going to look at this and find out what the truth is because of the fact that I've been in this restaurant before. People know me. People know that I didn't. And this person attacked me and everybody in the restaurant saw it. So there was plenty of witnesses. That didn't happen. The restaurant released the footage to the NYPD, and they didn't say anything. They wouldn't release the footage to us, so we didn't have the footage from the restaurant. The only footage that was out was of the cell phone video that this person had took and doctored and made it and put it on his, mm. put it on his blog and just put a wild night out in Chelsea and just put the, the list to his blog because at the time, I guess the guy was an intern for Love & Hip Hop, and he wanted some 
traction to his blog. Mm. And so that's what happened with that. And so, again, like I said, um, in answer to your question, uh, I was probably expected to stay in because they gave me a dispor dis disproportionate yeah. bail based upon my income and what I could afford. You know, they made my bail, not only did they make my bail $75,000, but it was a surety. Like I had to put up a property by it and I didn't own property. And it was just the fact that I was, I was able to get uh, my godfather to put up his property. That was the reason I was able to get out. And even when I, my, the bond was posted, they did not release me. I, had, I was involved in a class action suit. Uh, with, against uh, Riker's facility because of the fact that they kept me and held me longer than they were supposed to um, before releasing me. And uh, when they did release me again, like I said, um, there was no mention made of any type of, uh, any type of uh, charges being brought against the, the men who attacked me. And the narrative was already there. I just want to say, like, honestly, thank you. Like, thank you for coming here. I, I yes, couldn't yeah. imagine how... Yes, I can. How it is for you right now to come home, first and importantly, welcome home. Thank you. Yes, welcome, um, yes, welcome home. But to be acclimated and start to pick up on from where you left, which we call it frozen time, until you are now back released. Like, how has that been for you? Um, it's been difficult, uh, more difficult than I would have imagined because I, um, I was away for so long and, and certain things you give up when you're away that you don't realize that you give up. Like I forgot all the passwords to my social media so I couldn't go back on social media. You know, I couldn't, I, there were certain things that I didn't remember. There are certain things that have happened. I was away for so long that and life changed a lot while I was away. And coming from a place when you're in confinement like that to come back to a place like New York City, there's a certain amount of. Uh, I didn't realize how much depth had changed in like two years, amount, in those nine years. Change. And you like, I don't know how to do such a stuff. I was like, oh my God, that wasn't. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so, um, like, it was a lot to work with in that. And, and, and outside of that, you know, there, there are a certain amount of obstacles that come from, you know, dealing with reentry and, you know, uh, walking that line of trying to pick the pieces of your life back up and put it back together when you are convicted of something like this, you know what I'm saying? And um, having a certain amount of anxiety about even wanting to step out into the world or go places or go to a restaurant or be around people that you haven't been around or whatever, you know, not knowing how you'll be perceived, uh, not knowing if you are in danger. And there's certain um, prison safety mm -hmm. um, Guards that I have still, mm -hmm. like I, I, I have. I, they like call it institutionalized, me. right? You know, I like for example, I, I can hear what's going on behind me, you know, <laughs> more so than I used to. I don't like. I, don't, I get a private problem with people standing behind me, um, mm -hmm. loud noises, um, you know, certain things. I, I, I wake up out of my sleep quickly, and it's just. Um, it's those things. Like when yeah. you go to the yard and how you literally had to scan the yard quickly because right. if you didn't know where the target was, you might have been the target. It's going to go so down. So learning those type of things and like, and I was sharing with you privately earlier, like when the doors used to slam, right. it was a trigger for me. Right. You know, because you, just you never hear know. the cell door close. So it's those things that you have to That's learn right. to kind of like reprogram yourself. And I'm, and, and, what were some tools that you used to do that? Because like since been since I've been home, yeah. Like, what are some tools that you used um, to do that? Well, m most the most important thing is that you have to even getting out. I tell people all the time. Um, I benefited from having uh, a, a network or a, a certain close people around me who mm -hmm. were uh, adamant in making sure that my transition back was. Uh, one that was as easy as I possibly could have to. I was one of the fortunate. I was one of the fortunate that didn't necessarily have to go to a shelter or a halfway house. Um, I was able to, uh, you know, one of the person in the network actually Mitchell uh, had uh, invited me to uh, Thank God for live, with, live with them, and I uh, I was able to do that, and um, it was a blessing. And um, if I didn't have that, if I didn't have the uh, you know the support as far as therapy and uh, mental health, uh, and I probably would be a lot worse off. Um, and, you know, just, you know, getting back acquainted with my family, uh, you know, my
my sister, you know what I'm saying? She's, I know. Immediately she was, you know, right there, just, you know, when I came home and she's, you know, coming to see me. I, you know, I'll see her, I'll see her here, but like, I'll see her. Yeah, we, and even, I mean, you even kept, like, I can tell, even your growth, though, even even though that wasn't, I would have loved that it haven't been there, but, <laughs> like, the way, <laughs> no, the way, like, I can tell you was reading down in there, like, you could break down the laws. I'm like, it's giving lawyer yeah. right now. I'm like, you would have probably been able you to represent to, yourself You have to, I bet better. you stood in that law library yeah, like, because yeah, you're yeah. really fighting yeah, for your like, life. Yeah, like, He's like so like I'm like oh well, I'm learning from okay. the next yeah, council Listen, member and keeping motivated and inspiring like you was still inspiring me and I'm out here and I'm mm-hmm. talking to you like so I I you know I know it's gonna take some time but I see things like they about to get prepared because they're gonna go bonkers for you yeah. because your your purpose like you're so passionate you know you're driven and sometimes we have to take there's something that. Even though sometimes you're like, well, what the fuck? I got out that lesson. You know what I'm saying? Because yeah. of what happened. But there's things that you definitely you are going to take from that experience. And I'm sure that you're going to use to even grow and help others. There's along purpose the way. in your pain. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm always talking about um, Do you feel, do, are you going to step back into ballroom? You know, I, when the time is right, again, like I said, you know, I've been part of the ballroom community for almost 30 years now. You know, and I've I, we it's been a week you now. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, and shout out to my brother Stuart. You know, that's my birthday twin. I wish I could have been there last night. Um, you know, the birthday's on the same day. But I wish I could have been there last night for that and to see the thing. But I, you know, Thank again, you. I have these stipulations on me that I have to yeah. be. You know, I have to, um, you know, court order stipulations that I couldn't be out at a certain time. So I couldn't be out last night, unfortunately. Do you but be when the time itch? is right, do you, you be know having what I'm a little itch? Of course. Uh, <laughs> what, nine you o'clock know, curfew? You, want you, to be know, you, you, know, you know what time it is. You know what I do when I get out. You know what I'm saying? You know what it's given. 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 You know what You know, a lot of things have happened since I've been away. You know what I'm saying? So I need to get back in there. But we do got some questions. Let the legends come on back out. You know what I'm saying? I need to see. I need to see what's going on. You need to see. I need to represent my brother. God rest his soul. You know what I'm saying? I need to represent my brother who wrecked legendary realness. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. For him and for you know. And also, you know, I come from a, a, a legacy of that. You know what I'm saying? And it's one of the reasons why I joined the House of Ebony because of the fact that you know what I'm saying they have a bloodline of realness. And, and you know, I respect the fact that you know Dre and you know Roy and and and, and a lot of the other Shout brothers. Out. You know what I'm saying? Shout out to all of our realness brothers. You know what I'm saying? Um, face and all of them, you know what I'm saying? They all do it, out doing their thing. Oh, you were yeah. shouting them out. Let's bro. go. Yeah, Cover it. Definitely, you know, I would probably, when the time is right, say, you never know. So these categories come up, make sure y'all ready and prepared because you may see me okay. out there. You might look over uh, your shoulder. Oh. You might look <laughs> over your shoulder and say, uh oh. That's the real, that's all day, bro. Is that Zimmons? Oh my God. Let's lighten it yeah. up a little bit if y'all want to. What y'all think? Yeah. We, y'all ready for the game? So, yeah. I mean, what's next though before we go into the game? What's, uh, I mean, well, you kind of said what, you know, where you. Um, oh, like but. I said, um, I want to. I want to mention. I, would, I meant to bring you guys the gift that I have for you. Uh, again, the the book uh, that uh, my friend Harry had wrote. Harry was a young man who was involved. Uh, he was actually a student, and he uh, during the time of my trial, and he saw the narrative, and he realized that it was different, and he advocated and decided um, to investigate, and. Um, he wrote a book about his, his memoirs about his life and his journey into social activism. And he wrote about my case and the, you know, the uh, injustices that happened to me. And I appreciate he reached out to me while I was away and we, we became friends or whatever. And um, he linked me also with George, uh, George M. Johnson, who is, I'm telling you, I can't speak enough, enough about him uh, or them, I should say. And uh, they're, they're just honestly the, um, Wait. James Baldwin of this the, of this generation. I mean, he, they wrote a book, and the book is called All Boys Aren't Blue. Harry's book, the book that mentions me, is Black Boy Out of Time, Black Boy Out of Time by Harry Z at Z A Y E D, and uh, you know uh, George's book is uh, amazing. It's about his life and his his uh, experiences growing up um, as a young uh, you know queer person of color and how he came of age. And uh, the book, unfortunately, was banned by the state of Florida, and he sued the state of Florida. And uh, the book is a New York Times bestseller. He just was nominated for an Emmy for the audiobook, 
and he has like a six book deal. He's writing his fourth book right now, and he's helping me kind of right. put things together. He's also got song. Oh, he's really? house of Congress on. Yeah. Let me uh, say this: uh, the see? reason why I jumped yeah, up because see? I've heard That's you right. address that pronoun thing that everybody seemed to struggle with. You've been able to pause and say, "Let me say they." respecting the pronouns and just coming home. And I say that because people always struggle but with this. But you had to get... But no, he took his... Some, no, right, but no, I'm has, just saying that the the, the, the capacity <laughs> or the, the emotional uh, and mental capacity that you were willing to understand willing, and am, respect everyone's identity absolutely. speaks volume. Absolutely. And I will say that I respect and love my trans community. I have a key for my trans community. I fight for my trans community. So how yeah. could I not? Re- how Thank could you. I not see them as they are? They as they see themselves, and as the world should see them, and give them that respect. If I expect them to give me my respect, I would expect them to give me their, give them their. I want to give them theirs. But again, uh, coming from a situation where you're coming from a state of confinement and a state of almost uh, being completely isolated from your community and around people who are just cisgendered and mostly homophobic and you know coming from a situation where I'm around a lot of Muslims or whatever it's not I'm not I had not been used to asking people what your pronouns were because we didn't necessarily start we were back in you know 20 when I left we were not necessarily the people they were we weren't as conscious about it then Mm -hmm. as we are now so I kind of missed that being in that bubble and it, it, it does take a minute sometimes to understand it and respect it. And I don't understand it, but it, it takes a while to kind of kind of get into practice, especially because even in the barroom community, we are evolving. The barroom yeah. community is evolving into recognizing gender non-conforming, non-binary, intersex people. And uh, we were not necessarily, you know, they had, you know, little categories like maybe a while ago about, uh, and androgynous categories and things of that nature, but there was always you were either a butch queen or a femme queen. Even if you were butch queen and drag, you were still a butch queen. You know what I'm saying? So there was no gray area. There was no matriculation into somebody saying we're we're recognizing you and you're saying that you are gender nonconforming or you are non-binary. We we as a barber community didn't do that back then. And then it was even you remember in a situation where if they thought. Uh, 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 Bush Queen and oh, Drags sure. was uh, taking hormones or something like that, they would open they the shirt up and they grab in the street, squeeze them. Do you feel something? Mm-hmm. Oh, you taking and hormones or that? It was really disrespectful. And, and so as we evolve and learn, we grow. And I think that, you know, the, the, the community is growing. Um, it's an exciting time for the Baltimore community. I hope that we continue to keep our authenticity, authenticity as it grows because it, it will be very easy to take something of value and take it and morph it into something else and forget the, the ori- origin. origins of where it came from. So oh, the, the original borrowing community needs to make sure that we put our stamp on what it is that we hold and we built that everyone now loves and is being so populated and so, and so, you know, so popularized and, and make sure that we keep it and hold it ourselves <laughs> yes. because if not, we're going to lose it. And, and uh, unfortunately, that's happened with a lot of different things. And, and you know, it's hot right now. But again, um, that's something that has to be really um, taken into consideration. So I hope that, you know, we as a community do that. Baby. That's thank that's you. A, I, well, I just want to say thank you before. Thank you, right? Because this moment right now may not seem, this is a huge deal that Girl, you came and said this. Life. This is really huge. Like. <laughs> I'm so glad that you're well, here. Like, Thank I'm you. I'm happy to be here. I'm glad to be here too. I mean, like listen, I sit and watch. I've watched every episode. Yeah. 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 I'm yeah. telling you, I've watched every. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen everybody on here. Like, uh, I seen with the Sean on here. I seen you know, the Lolo on here. I was like, wow, Barbie on here. I was like, well, you know, I'm everybody was on here. I was like, and then you know, Shay Shay came up here and was talking. That's my mom. You know what I'm yeah. saying? So that's the only mother I've ever had. So the eye, you know, was there. He was there. Yeah, so uh, the folks was making pallets and we was right. building up. And- <laughs> Well, I'm Collins was always you. a baller. So, you know. <laughs> you ready <laughs> for the game? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, you had to make a way know, out of nowhere. That's what the father Uh-oh. does. They provide, <laughs> yes. you know? He said, you, know, you know what he give. Yeah, yeah we have to provide. You know what I'm saying? Let's play. Let's play. What's up? Yeah, y'all ready for the game? You know what he give. Yeah, yeah. Come on, what's the game? So this is what you call the crazy, sexy 
cool game, and you're gonna pick. You know, going to go. Oh, is this the questions and stuff? Yeah, oh, here we go. Yes. <laughs> and if you don't oh, answer, the questions. I think we were a little bit. I, I we can't say that's that's anonymous. Oh, okay. So I know her handwriting. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's not everybody. Her. We're not putting that. In. <laughs> well, whatever. Reaching to grab one. One. Right? Yeah, go ahead. Three, Let it's me three help questions. you. Out. It's three. Oh, it's three questions, huh? He doesn't drink, so that's water. Yeah. Let's be very clear. <laughs> Have you ever dated a femme queen? And if not, would you name who? Ooh. Oh, God. I'm just thinking of your water. <laughs> Let me just say <laughs> that um, I recognize the beauty in all things. And <laughs> there are some beautiful women out here, honestly. And uh, I'm not opposed to it. At all, I never have been, and there has been uh, a couple over the years who have regarded my attention, you know. But have I ever publicly dated or been with? No, you would have known this, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I have, I have but I know that there are a few <laughs> that you know. Um, Couple in particular that have had that eye on me, and I mean, oh baby, eye on. they used to want to throw their <laughs> draw really, that you. Yeah. Right. So, uh, they're like, so, no, no, you know, no, I guess you know. I'm like, girl, that, that comes from you know. That's just I think a lot has to do with my size, my stature. You know, what I mean, but you know, it's to get to know the person. But yeah, they be like, that's a man, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the big old man. Yeah, crazy. Next question. But um, I ain't gonna say who. Ooh. Ooh. Oh, well, you gotta take the drink. You, you need to answer the, the whole drink. question. Then go ahead, drink your water. Just get water. Go ahead, drink your water, baby. Water hydrates. Yeah, I it's need three it, questions. You, lights, you still two have, more. yeah. I need this water. Okay, one more. It's two more. Two yeah, more. Two okay. more. <laughs> <laughs> he said, "I need the water." He's starting to sweat now, huh? Which realness legend don't you see it for? Mm. Oh. Name one. <laughs> oh, 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 you got a couple. A few. You can a couple out of it. No, it's just that I feel that um, it's not just about legendary. It's not just about um, you know walking the category or you used to walk it back in the day and you still walk it. It has to be a situation where there was a rain. There has to be a situation to where you have made an impact um, to be what's considered legend. And I think that. As the bar matures, the status has been kind of brought down a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it shouldn't be that way. And I think that, you know, um, there are some people who have just been getting by. You know, we come from the black era. <laughs> <laughs> and our era is different than the other eras because of the fact that our era is the era that, that the ballroom scene that. matriculated to she different was, states. Yeah, I mean, so yeah. we had to get out there and hit that yes, road. We and we had Ooh. to go to places like Detroit and Chicago and you know, up here. We had to come from Atlanta and come up here Philly. and then, you know, all out in Philly and then all these different places or whatever and go to different places and make the, you know, it wasn't just that you could just go to one place or live in one place and just say, you know what I'm saying? As it's sometimes been afforded now. Well, so. you couldn't just have a YouTube clip either because we was right. VHS. Right. So you, it, it wasn't gonna, exactly. You had to be there to see it. You had to be there to see it. You had to be there to see it. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> and it just wasn't about just, you know, a cash category or whatever. And people did it because they wanted to bring yes. the, the, the competition. Creation. They wanted yes. to bring that creativity. And they also wanted to bring that that name for themselves and for their house. You know what I'm saying? It was a certain amount of pride that went into who you were and what your last name was. And it wasn't just about building your first name. So um, in that sense, um, there are a couple of people who I don't feel <laughs> have paid their dues. I, don't, I think that there are a couple of people out there who are kind of like, um, I would say ballroom, I wouldn't necessarily call them celebrities, but they are ballroom uh, notables. And they kind of had, have kind of been making their name because they're popular, not necessarily because of the fact that they ever wanted to see me because some of them haven't. And it's been times where I've come out for particular people in particular who have been in the building ready and they wouldn't come out and wouldn't, you know what I'm saying? Or they, or they kind of like set the panel a little bit. They know their <laughs> friends is on the panel. I'm gonna talk about it. You know, their friends be on the panel. <laughs> and they'll have, they know they got this vote, this vote, this vote or whatever. And they done told this from the start down to that end, you know what I'm saying? And so it's like, you know. 
But it is what it is. I'm not going to sit in the name names, but you Oh, know you did you all are. of that. You, you know who name. you are. You know You're not going to name that one. Oh, you you, you had gave us the okay. voice right. change and everything. Come I on. thought you was leading okay, up to so it. I was like, okay. Oh, well, oh my God. You're going to call him out. They can wait and they can wait in the back. You got to say, okay, we'll drink your water. You're going to call him out. We'll drink your water. Okay, the, the, you, you gotta. Know, I'm gonna tell y'all who it is. No, I'm just you know who you are. <laughs> okay. You know who you are. I'm gonna hold the glasses on. See I, me. Okay. Yeah, one more. Yeah. I don't know what's all these stuff together. Maybe I should. Have okay. Some Ooh. <laughs> okay. Ooh. So maybe I should have some both of them. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I already know. Oh, <laughs> no. Y'all are bugging out. Now listen. <laughs> I'm going to start this one off by saying that what this says, let me just say this. Y'all are not going <laughs> to Would you get back with Dre Evan? Oh. Ooh. We're talking about the iconic pioneer, Dre Evan. <laughs> Is that who we're talking about? Oh. We're talking about Dre. Okay, so let me just say, first of all, shout out to Dre. Y'all been long-time friends. Said, so, so Dre and I have been long-time friends. We've had a long relationship as friends, and he's always been someone who I've looked up to and admired on the ballroom uh, scene, because not only because of his ballroom prowess itself, his ballroom IQ, I would say, but because of the fact that he was the undisputed leader of the house after Larry had left, and he was the one who was making it known. And he's, you know, you know, as, as much as a leader as Jihad was, this is Jihad's father, you know what I'm saying? And he was unquestionable when it came down to the way he moved in the scene, in and out of the scene. It wasn't just the fact that at that time, it wasn't just the fact that the Ebony's were just a ballroom house. The Ebony's was a street house, you know what I'm saying? And they moved, moved it, you know what I'm saying? They did it. And so I respected him for that. But then I respected the transition that he made to go step away from that life and become someone who wanted to advocate for the community and become someone who wanted to get back to himself and decide to go back to school at an, a, a, a later age in life and get his master's degree and you know, do all the things that he have, he's done, all the accomplishments he's done. He's an amazing, he's the definition to me of an icon. Um, you know, uh, to be honest, you know, when he and I started our relationship, uh, I was still Chanel, I was Father Chanel at the time. Uh, we, I don't know what happened. Me and Fred went out to LA to walk the LA Awards. And we actually won that night. We walked out there and we just kind of linked out there. And then after that, I saw him when I had, me and Jack had the Rumble Ball in Detroit. And Jack came up there and we did the first Rumble in Detroit. And I had the ball up there. And he came up there for that. And I think that we just kind of linked. And it was just a situation that happened. And, you know, we were together. And this was not something that was easy because of the fact that we were two, you know, you know, people who were prominent figures in the ballroom and leaders in the ballroom and two male figures in the ballroom that, you know what I'm saying, people are like, well, what y'all doing? You know what I'm saying? Because of the fact that we are two... Uh, we who's zooming who? Right. And, and, you know, people, who's people, zooming people, who? You know what I'm saying? But, but we, were, we were very much um, together and in love at the, at the time. Um, relationships evolve, relationships oh grow. Oh, my God. I know how... Now, I, I could not think of the other people to ask about. Because I was going to say pick out of the, I was going to name a few people more of them, which yeah, one you would not. be back with. Yeah, well, you escaped that thing I couldn't remember. I, you, know, listen, <laughs> you know I got names too, right? Oh! I have a very oh. I know you do, okay. but this is your game. We're playing okay. this game with right. you. Right. <laughs> <laughs> those names to us. <laughs> yeah, please give them to us so we can get it. So would you be back with him or not? No, like I said, I feel like our relationship has evolved from that. I mean, okay. I mean, who knows what would happen, Who what would happen in the future. I mean, it's not like I, I you know, I love Dre, like, as a person, you know what I mean? But, you know, I just feel like our relationship has evolved behind, beyond that. I mean, I'm saying that now, but who knows? I mean, you know, who knows what life brings. Dre ain't thinking about no, me. Dre doing Dre so busy trying to... <laughs> that, that, this man is out doing foreign exchange. This man is... Yes, he, he is. He can't stay in the country half right. the time, so I ain't even thinking about me. Yes, he is. But He's I see. I talk, I talk to him all the way up here, so. Yeah, I know. Dre loves you. Y'all yeah. love Thank you. That Thank was three, you. right? Yes, that's that was three. three. Oh my Thank God. Thank y'all. I'm so happy I came up here. I'm so happy you came up here. I'm oh so my happy God, you got to, too. You know, you got to tell your story. That was yes. a lot of energy. So many people wanted to hear that. Thank you for sitting with us. Thank you for being so vulnerable and transparent. Like, I yes. know you have, I know that wasn't easy. I know you probably was, did you, you oh. nervous? You can tell us now. Well, I mean, not to say nervous, but I'm sweating. <laughs> I'm sweating. Like, um, <laughs> I'm sweating. It's hot. It's hot. 
I ain't, got no, I ain't got none of that though. Thank you. This has been another dope thank episode. You. you know I love thank you, you, brother. I love you Thanks too. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. Uh, thank we you. love y'all. Make sure y'all tune back in on the next episode. Of? <laughs> the next episode of? Crazy. Sexy. Cool. Crazy. Crazy. Y'all got your own chant, right? <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>